as most of you know, uh, this is the uh, National Science Foundation IGERT Distinguished Lecture Series. The NSF IGERT is a program that uh, recruits PhD students into interdisciplinary areas, in our case in the smart environments area. And part of that grant is also to support bringing in distinguished speakers. And so today we have Rich Levinson, who is the uh, founder and president of BrainAid.com. And so we're going to hear about uh, the work they do there. Um, Rich has a long history in AI. He was at NASA Ames for 20 years, working on uh, planning and on uh, uh, automating a, the, the robotics yeah, um, platforms they have there at NASA. Uh, but uh, today he is going to be talking about how some of that work getting transferred to uh, being able to uh, be able to prompt, uh, you know, integrate planning and prompting into a cognitive age. And so, you know, uh, Hello, thank you all for coming and hearing us talk. And uh, I have to say, we're really impressed with what you're doing here. And I think uh, we've uh, we've learned a lot. And uh, but uh, hopefully, don't you'll see some stuff here that you find interesting and uh, maybe some opportunities for collaboration. So I'm going to talk about um, what we do at BrainAid.com, which is independent uh, cognitive aids for independent living. Um, okay. And so, <laughs> um, and so uh, basically, yeah, we're at BrainAid.com. Our now we're looking at Polycom. Okay. Um, so we get the slides up. Okay. Uh, and so our, our long name is Attention Control Systems, but that's too long and confuses everyone. So we're, we're really going with BrainAid.com now, and you can go to our website and find out a little bit more. Um, we do have a, a long background um, with a, a significant amount of uh, federal agency funding. So I'll just start with uh, my roots were at NASA Ames Research Center, and I was working on autonomous systems. And the idea was trying to uh, integrate planning and reaction in things like the Mars rover, because you can't give them a plan down here and expect it to work up there with all the uncertainty and changes. So you need a system that uh, you can give it some plan and some goals, but some flexibility also. And it has to, of course, have sensors and be able to integrate it all and figure out, is it on the plan? Does the plan have to be adjusted? And the most important part is to complete the plan and achieve your goals. So that was really what I was working on. Um, and that was in the um, early 90s and psychology, uh, neuropsychologists were just starting to really talk about this thing called executive functions. Um, and uh, it was really uh, eye-opening for me to realize that the stuff we were trying to put into computers was actually quite similar to what was uh, often very impaired in people with uh, brain injury is where we really started. So this is largely talking about uh, young people and car accidents and motorcycle accidents, but really, of course, anyone can have a brain injury. So after um, starting it out at NASA, my boss there said, go test it out at a local hospital. So we started working with Valley Medical Center, which is a really big brain injury treatment center in San Jose, California. Uh, we got some funding from NIDER, which is part of the Department of Education, to actually test this. We did a, um, a randomized control trial with about 90 patients half of which got Pete, half, which is our product, and half of which used a memory notebook. You know, we did some testing there. Uh, of course, uh, with the war and everything, a lot of veterans coming back with brain injury and PTSD, that led to uh, more funding, actually, from DARPA. Um, and we started working with the VA. And another DOD component is Patrick, which deals with advanced uh, medicine. Um, so that's where a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk to you about today um, got this funding from the Department of Education to really start adding sensors to this uh, cognitive aid that we had. And uh, most recently, we've gotten some funding from the Department of Education to apply this to uh, students with autism and other special education students. So um, you know, our problem is cognitive impairment. Um, we see a range of the different folks that we do work with. Here's our, our VA clinician, a, a, a veteran with brain injury. Uh, we work with the elderly, um, folks with ADHD, and, um, and there's a, a young uh, girl who has autism. These are all the type of people that we work with in our, in our, uh, in our system. Um, but out of the whole world of cognitive impairment, I mean, you understand that there's memory problems, people can't remember where their keys are, maybe forget a word here or there, uh, but one part of cognitive impairment that we're really focused on are these executive functions, and 
Um, some of the folks here uh, probably do understand what those are, but I'll just kind of give a quick story for those who don't. Uh, executive functions really help people get things done. Uh, help you set your goals, put plans together, initiate, stick with the plan, and follow through, and handle with errors anything that happens up, and you know, again, try to get stuff done. Um, and a big uh, area of this also is that multitasking and error correction is a big challenge. Um, interactions and distractions can pull a person off the task and they may have a very difficult time getting back on. Um, and also, um, if something in the environment is really, really grabbing at them, it's very difficult uh, for people with executive function impairment to kind of step out um, and kind of take a second track and recognize, hey, there's something going on here, I better do something different. So, so these are kind of characterized as some of the problems we're dealing with. Um, this kind of shows how it fits in with the NASA idea is that what we're really talking about here is something that closes the sense plan active. And you know, there's a lot of prompting systems out there that you know you can put a schedule in and it'll remind you when it's time to eat breakfast. Um, but our system is different in that it actually has all of these all these components built into uh, the software, which is an Android app. Um, so you know, we put a plan together, we prompt the user, uh, but then we use some sensors to figure out well how's that going, and we may need to prompt, uh, replan, and go back around the loop again. Um, and executive functions are really a must-have for independence and autonomy, and so it's a really critical issue to address uh, in people with cognitive impairment. Um, this is an interdisciplinary group, so I thought I'd throw up my interdisciplinary slide, and uh, you know, this is really who we are. As, uh, you know, my roots are here in computer science, um, really again on autonomy, uh, balancing planning and reaction, um, but I've been hanging out with neuropsychologists for quite a while, and I've actually published some, uh, some work that applies, tries to take some of these computer models and uh, recast some of the executive function models that have been published in neuropsychology uh, in these computer model terms. And of course, then consumer electronics is, uh, is another part of our, our whole approach. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce you to Pete. Uh, Pete is the planning and execution assistant trainer. You see on the uh, side there, that's a, a schedule. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a live demo so you'll get to see some action. But, uh, but here you can see it's basically got a, sca uh, a schedule. This one was actually chosen from one of our autistic uh, classrooms. Um, but the idea is that you can have your activities in here. Um, they're all linked to relevant information. Uh, you get a picture of their timesheet, uh, thing that they work on. You can have checklists and all kinds of uh, linked information to provide access to task-related information. Um, Really, you know, it's all about personalization. Uh, there's a lot of personal personalization in this, so you know everyone with everyone's different, but certainly everyone with cognitive impairment is, is different, um, and needs very uh, very different ways to help uh, provide the reminders and the cues. So we have a whole different uh, array of different ways to provide reminders, and uh, and the interface can be rearranged. All the different buttons and access to different sections can be hidden and removed and customized and simplified. So there's just stuff on the screen that this particular person needs to use and there's not gonna be anything else that would confuse them. Uh, we actually do have three patents on this, on our core technology of uh, monitoring and prompting and, uh, and replanning uh, for cognitive aids. Um, and one of the things we're uh, very interested to talk to you all about here is that uh, Pete is available as a tool for researchers. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty mature Android app with a lot of whistles and bells, um, but it's got hooks in there for uh, clinicians and researchers who want to test out different theories, they can just kind of plug it in, they don't have to build um, everything from scratch. So, um, now what is executive functions in Pete? Uh, again, it basically means generating a schedule. Um, Pete's unique in this prompting world because we actually pay attention to time windows, task durations, sequence constraints, and priorities, and all these types of things. Um, so we generate a plan. Um, you'll see we have some flexibility in the way these plans are generated. Um, execution for us is providing the reminders to start and stop the activities. Then we want to be detecting when there's a certain situation there went off track. We have to do some replanning and then do that replanning. And then uh, working memory, which is another big part of executive functions for us, means access to the task relevant information. So we can provide uh, hooks to different apps and information that will just show up on the screen just during a particular task and then it'll disappear uh, to not confuse people. Um, it's really intended to be an autonomous assistant. As I said, my background is in autonomy, and so we don't want it to be just a talking alarm clock. We really want this thing to be taking the perspective of a human assistant that's trying to figure out, okay, not only you know, did I figure out you need to you know, go, get your laund you know, go pick up your laundry at a certain time, but actually figuring out when's the best time to prompt, when's the best time to remind them to do it, and what's the best way to remind them to do it. So really trying to move into this idea that 
But this is an, a, a, an executive assistant, and not only, you know, if we're not really compensating for the patient's executive functions, we actually want to build the autonomy and the executive functions into our app itself to do a better job of prompting. Um, and we kind of look at it, it's like, it's like a GPS navigator for time instead of space. You know, this whole idea of recalculating, recalculating, you missed a turn, happens to us in time all the time. And so that's really what we're about. And, uh, and from the beginning, we've, uh, we've really tried to aim for real world use, um, rather than clinical or training settings. Because when we started, you know, really the interventions, and even today, you see a lot of products like positive science, uh, brain training games, and all these things. And, you know, <laughs> their ability to transfer to the real world is, is still somewhat questionable. I mean, I think they can prove neurogenesis, they can prove it can maybe sprout some new neurons, but really how is that gonna help them make sure they get stuff done? And so we're really all about the real world. Um, here you see a little bit of how, how the queuing works. We, we provide a start queue, and again, I'll show you an example in a second. You show a start queue, it'll come up and say, hey, uh, it's time to start this task. You may have various options that say, I'm, I need to wait 15 minutes, or I'm gonna skip it. And this is where it starts getting into, well, I better start replanning. If you, if you cause a delay in your schedule, what's gonna happen to the rest of the afternoon, or for tomorrow, or if you skip a task, or if you add a higher priority task in, things are gonna have to get juggled around. And that's where our system really comes into play. And uh, you know, when you start a task, it'll say, okay, continue this, give some countdown, give some buttons and access to different stuff. And then we also provide a stop queue at the end of a task. And that's also um, relatively unusual for prompting systems, uh, but really, really important for people with cognitive and executive function impairment who may get locked into the present moment. They may be stimulus bound, and if the stimulus is still in front of them, they're just gonna keep doing the same thing. Um, and you know, they can separate. So we provide these stop cues too. Um, so, just gonna, so this is kind of just the, the loop, and then I'll show a demo right after this, but just gives you a little preview. So the idea is that first, um, you might have a cue card, um, and you'll, you'll see variations of the way the display looks. This is a black screen with no buttons on the bottom. There are other ones that are more colorful with buttons on the bottom, not all just because it all can be customized. But here we're saying we may have some free time until the bank activity starts. Uh, then we'll get that cue to start the bank. And I'll say, great, continue to bank for a certain amount of time, and then you get that stop cue. And I think this is where I'm gonna to try to run the live demo. Give me a second to get this set up here. Um, okay, let me just hold on here. To demo. screen capture, so I'm actually running a Okay, so now here you're going to see Pete coming up. Let's see what we have here on our schedule. Share again. So we have a bunch of different libraries you can load. I was trying to do something a little fancier than I should have. So let me just go and do the simple case. Oh, I can't do that. So one of the things that is, uh, is helpful in Pete is that you, you do have these libraries that can be shared and reused um, if you're using them in a clinical setting. Okay, so here you see Pete's running. This is running on a Galaxy tablet, a seven inch tablet. And it's counting down and saying we have free time until this tax starts. Uh, we have different sections in Pete. If I wanna go over to the calendar section, I tap that upper right hand corner, it's gonna show us, um, here's, here's the activity that we have scheduled for today. But remember, it was counting down, and when it gets to noon, or a few seconds before noon, it automatically jumps over the cue card, and then it'll provide, it'll provide that cue. Let me turn the volume up so you can hear it. But the idea is it's gonna provide the start cue. <coughs> and it's a, uh, it's a persistent cue, so um, the power could be completely turned off of the device, you could be in a different act, doesn't have to be running, and it'll come up and get right in your face and start providing this cue. And uh, you're, uh, if I try to get out of it by hitting the back button or so anywhere else, it's just going to keep responding to me. Um, you're, hearing a you're hearing a computer voice, um, but it can also be voice recording, so it can be more of an ecologically valid voice or whatever can be appropriate. It could be a ringtone, it can be vibrate only, so a little more quiet, it could be silent, all kinds of different options. Again, all these different options can also be removed. You may have users that 
really can't be trusted to respond to these things. And maybe what's appropriate is just that they hear the cue. They just know, oh, it's 11 o'clock, they hear a cue, it's supposed to do something. They don't even have to respond to any of these things. But um, start bank. in this case, I'm going to go ahead and say let's start our bank. And uh, once we do that, it'll go ahead and say, great, uh, you've got, uh, we got, gave ourselves 10 minutes to do this. So during the task, um, you have access to task relevant information. So if I tap on this links button here, it'll take us over to um, information that's appropriate for that task. It could have a picture of the bank, um, and it can also have third-party apps on there. So this is a calculator app that we didn't write. It's just an Android app that you can import and say, here's this app that you can have when you're looking when you're doing your bank task and you can get to it. So that's a lot of what we're doing is kind of putting guardrails up on the Android device. Um, you can lock people just into the cue card, for example. Uh, <coughs> all they'll ever see is what's happening right now and they'll have access to the stuff that's on that cue card, but not much else. Um, uh, we started working again with some folks with language problems with autism and we added uh, this little button on the left here. Continue bank until 12, 11 p.m. And so that, that can help people remember what's going on. Um, again, all these things can be hidden and removed. There's a couple buttons down here and this or that. But I think what we want to show you in this demo is a little bit about this flexible activity schedule. So uh, what I will do is I will go to the calendar section and show you what's going on with this schedule. And so here we have a schedule that we've laid out. Uh, this shows that we've completed our wake-up task, we skipped breakfast, and we're now in the middle of this bank activity. Um, they each have links to relevant information. For example, this is a shopping list. Um, this links us directly to the contact information for Susan, the button we can call her or send a, send a text message. Um, but what we want to show you is that there's actually a lot of flexibility in schedule. What we set up is at the bank, the lunch, shopping, these all have big time windows. They basically have to be done within a few hours. They don't take that long. Um, but then we have this immovable object right in the middle, this movie. Um, and so what we'll show you is what happens if we get stuck at the bank. Um, it's trying to squeeze shopping in before the movie, but if we get stuck at the bank, things are going have to have to get juggled around. So just give you a little bit of a demonstration of that. Um, first, I'll just show you that the uh, kind of the way we do our flexibility is if we look at this lunch task. Um, basically, the idea is you have a time window. In this case, 12 to 2:30, and it's going to take 40 minutes. And that's that's how we kind of do that magic. And then you can say it repeats every day. So it's a lot less data entry. You just put this in one time and you give it this flexible time windows um, and you don't have to individually program it for every day. Um, there's also a lot of options such as how do you want to do the queuing. Um, you can have a warning some number of minutes before the task actually starts and then you can say, okay, well, when is this a start queue? I want it to be a text-to-speech queue or voice recording. I want to make sure that the user confirms it or not. So these are all various queuing options that uh, are available. So let's go back and then say, okay, so let's, let's say we're going through our day. And as I was saying, the, the shopping is pretty flexible. We have shopping set up here so that it should be done um, anytime between 12.30 and 5.30. And it's only going to take an hour. So there's a lot of flexibility on that. Um, you also see that we have it linked to a shopping list, which can have... Uh, various uh, forms of information on it, including voice recordings, um, pictures, photographs, anything you really want that's part of uh, your shopping list. Oh, and then you have check, check marks on, uh, on the far left there. So I'm gonna do a little uh, trick here we call time warp. We're just gonna pretend it's gonna um, suddenly zoom up about uh, seven minutes and it'll be um, the end of the bank test. So I'll just do this thing, time warp goes to the next event. This is just used for demonstration and purposes and testing purposes. But basically it says, great, you've been to the bank for 10 minutes. Um, again, it's going to jump over the cue card. It's going to provide our cue. Stop bank. Okay, so are we done at the bank? Well, um, no. Let's say we're stuck online. We need, need some more time. So we could come in here and say, let's wait. Uh, we need 15 minutes. It's not great. It gave us 15 minutes, but what happened to the rest of our schedule? We were, we were trying to get a whole bunch of stuff done before the movie. Um, if we go back and look at the schedule now, we'll see that uh, Pete has made the adjustments. It uh, moved shopping till after the movie and actually squeezed exercise. Exercise was originally scheduled for an hour from 4 to 5, but it had to be done by 5.30. 
So with this disruption in the schedule, it, it did the best it could and exercised as the lowest priority task, so it took the brunt of it, and it basically got pushed to the end and squeezed down to a half hour. Um, and, you know, doing our shopping uh, after the movie. And, but it's very elastic, so if we actually finished our bank task early, go ahead and say stop it now, it'll all snap back into place. So, uh, there you go, shopping's back, and we've got our full exercise uh, restored. So, it gives you a little sense of what Pete looks like in, in operation. Um, and I think I'm gonna switch over to some slides again. So, just, uh, right, so that was executing tasks. And then, you know, it's talked about, there's a lot of queuing options. When do you want to do the queue? Um, should it be at the beginning or the end? And I know there's a lot of folks here working on, maybe, lunch. maybe it should be somewhere in between. <laughs> Persistent, okay. <laughs> now, if it had census, it would have known on all the eight. That, that system's not hooked up with census. Um, but um, what, what queue sound should it play? So here you see some options, do we automatic? text-to-speech, voice recording, none, vibrate only. And I showed you some of those queuing options already. Um, and we actually talked about this, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but this is just showing how we have those flexible time uh, elements, this will free up some time to talk about um, some new stuff. And then again, connect it to people, so if you're, you're having a, a meeting with uh, Susan, you click on that, you're immediately sent over to her contact information, and actually if she has an address, you can click on the address and it'll bring up a navigator and give you step-by-step you know, -step instructions on how to get to that person. Um, we have a task wizard. We try to make it really easy to get information into the system. So you just kind of click this wizard hat and say what do you want to do and it'll walk you through the steps. It'll prompt you through each step. What's the name of the task? When should it be? How long should it be? Um, so you don't have to kind of go in and fill out this big form of data. It's going to prompt you through it. And we're actually building a speech version of this so that I think if you've seen a later slide, you can just click on a little microphone we make available, and it'll take you through this conversation totally through speech. It'll say it, and then you can speak back into it if you have an internet connection, because then it can do uh, voice recognition on the cloud. Um, so we've been at this for a while, and it's really built on a lot of layers. So I just wanted to kind of give this to, to provide some scope to it. You know, here's our peak commercial product, and pretty much what I just explained to you is the peak commercial product. Um, we, then we did this ev evidence-based research I mentioned earlier about the RCT. Um, but what we're really here to talk about, I think, a lot is the sensor stuff, the stuff that we've actually been able to build on top of this um, with some funding from DARPA, OSD, and then more recently from Department of Education. And so kind of building up, uh, the first thing we did is add sensors and some activity recognition to it. Um, and that then really started to provide some real context to where executive function uh, assistant and some contingency queue, queues that were not scheduled but would happen only if a certain condition got triggered, like if someone stepped outside without their cane, we're gonna go and remind them, go get your cane. Um, but that wasn't really scheduled for any one particular time, so contingent queuing was really uh, nice. And then, um, and you know, therapy compliance and monitoring. Um, then the next level we did, uh, these are actually in parallel, was trying to start to focus on folks with uh, PTSD and to build a speech interface to it. Um, and also to add a biosensor. So the idea is we're now dealing with folks with PTSD, they get really overwhelmed, and uh, so we started to try to add a heart rate monitor in there that, that would feed into Pete that we could use to um, detect when they're overwhelmed, and then have these, uh, what we call plug-in contest triggered interventions that'll pop up a picture of their therapist, perhaps, and walk them through a series of uh, coping strategies. And then uh, more recently, with the Department of Education, we actually started using this with uh, kids with autism and special ed, as I was mentioning. Um, but that actually led to a lot of really great developments that are actually really appropriate for everyone else, such as these idea of pop-up messages that can pop up every few minutes, or when a person transitions between activities or changes location, it'll pop up these, uh, these activity reminders. So anyway, just so you get a sense, there's a lot of different uh, layers there. Um, and to give a little bit here of the overview for those inclined to see these type of things. This is actually our system. Um, here's our Android. Uh, this is our commercial core. We've got our interface, we've got our planner and our controller. Um, then all this other stuff is the fun stuff we've added in. Um, we basically, we have some sensors built into the Android, things like GPS, phone status, battery, accelerometry, other apps. Um, we can, they're actuators, we can you know, turn some of these on or off. 
Um, and we've got these external sensors, and I'm going to show you some of them. But basically, we've got environment sensors that can tell where there's motion or in cabinets open and close. Um, we've got some shake sensors, accelerometers that can tell you when objects move. Um, all these things basically feed into this external sensor monitor. Um, then we've also been working with uh, Henry Mount at the University of Rochester, and they've actually uh, developed a state estimator and also an additional Q planner, which is a, a different approach. It's a probabilistic Q planner based on a, um, um, hidden Markov models, uh, whereas our Q planner is not probabilistic. There's actually P is not probabilistic as it, at its core, but uh, these guys have added some of that capability in, and so that's how it all fits together. Um, so yeah, so this is really you know, what we did with all this R&D is, in, in a nutshell, we added sensors to enable context awareness. We've added a speech capability, and we've really tried to start pushing hard on this idea that instead of just putting people's activities in there, we want to plug in interventions. And so this whole idea that it's, a, it's an extension of the therapist, they, get, they can actually reach out and touch the patient outside the clinical setting. Of course, it's the same thing they practice in the clinical setting. It's just more opportunity to uh, engage with the patient. Um, here you see a list of all the different sensors that we have in our sensor panel. <clears throat> so now you get to see some of our sensors. This is what we started with. Uh, this was a very experimental RFID reader bracelet. It's actually a reader, an RFID reader. It had about a six centimeter range. We put tags on all kinds of stuff in the house, and we tried to realize when you picked up a dish or picked up this or that, but it was really kind of an engineering mess. This is actually an antenna that has to wrap around your wrist. It has to be individually tuned for each person. And you don't want to change the size, and your wrist is too big. It's going to be a problem. Anyway, it was a great idea by Intel Research, but really didn't have the commercial potential. Um, of course, GPS is built into it, so we can use GPS. Um, and then these are these Insteon sensors that we're using. This is your infrared motion sensor. You've probably seen plenty of them. Um, these are just contact switches, and they separate when the door opens and the cabinet opens. Um, this is an appliance sensor. All that stuff uh, basically sends wireless data that, you know, you saw that architecture diagram feeds into our Android device so that we can actually do a better job of prompting. That's the real purpose of all these sensors is to uh, figure out what's really happening with this person and provide context-appropriate prompting. And uh, I'll give you some examples of that. Just some more examples of our sensors. This is the shake sensor we're using. Uh, it's a great sensor, but they seem to have decided to go in a different direction. Um, we're about to start some case studies at the VA, and we're still going to get to use these sensors. But I'm uh, not sure they're going to be commercial available. But basically, you see this thing looks like a ketchup packet. Um, we strapped on, taped onto a, a, a cereal box or a teapot. And then we could tell when you, when you tip the teapot over. Um, this is this heart rate monitor wristwatch that we're using. And then this is um, an indoor localization thing. It can tell if this watch is, is, these are in all your different outlets, and it can tell which outlet that watch is closest to. So we can kind of sense of where you are in the house. Um, one of our key innovations with all this is that we, and this is how the sensors plug into our system, is that we've added these idea of start conditions and preconditions. So here you have your activity, kind of like the ones we showed you earlier with the lunch and the shopping, but we added a couple more properties here. And so th these, are, these are basically uh, monitored conditions. This is saying that, um, well, let's just start with this one. Um, we have this activity called make cereal, which is part of our morning routine. Uh, and we're going to say, well, if you notice that the cereal moved um, within three minutes, um, let's just assume that this test started. And so we can use that. Um, that the, basically, the sensor data comes in. Um, and if the shake sensor on the cereal box says it moved and it got a timestamp on it, we can compare that timestamp to the current moment. And if it happened within three minutes, we're actually going to say um, that that activity started. And then we'll adjust the thing. I'll show you an example of that. And as a separate example is, uh, let's say we want to go out and get mail. And these are two different types of conditions. These are start conditions. And then these are preconditions. So this one says, let's assume that you're going to get, you're going to get mail if um, the front door is open, so we have the contact switch. It shows that the door is open. That's, that's this picture right here, actually. You can see this contact switch is separated and the light is on. And then, um, but also that there's pressure on the doormat. We have a little sensor that you're stepping outside, the door is open. Um, great, you're going to go get your mail. Let's check your precondition. Wait, the cane hasn't moved. So we have one of these shake sensors on the cane. We know you're stepping out, you don't have your cane. And so we're going to provide a prompt that says, please go get your cane. Um, Another thing we have here is um, that makes it helpful for kind of high level dealing with this is we have a we can set up a whole bunch of activities in advance 
with the proper pictures, the proper queuing options. And you can put on this template list. It's basically a drop down menu so that when you want to add tasks to your activity, to your system, you don't have to start from scratch. You can just pull these off and they can be available to the patient or the user too. So a caregiver or clinician can set up an activity with all the prompting stuff and then the user can kind of add it on demand using a wizard and say, oh, I want to add a task. Oh yeah, that's the task I want. And then all the other properties come along with it. And then we take the step of script of uh, templates one step further and say that you can actually have uh, activity sequences. So here's a script. Um, we call it the morning the morning script, and it's basically made up of these two different sub steps: um, waking and eating. And you can actually specify that there should be, let's say, five minutes. You can have up to five minutes between these tasks. So the idea is that these are going to be considered as one unit. You add the task called morning. It's going to put these two subtasks in it with the proper time between it, and it's going to respect the sequence. So um, if you get delayed on wake, it's going to it's going to push eating back. So that's let's treat it as a unit. Um, so really, it helps people uh, break large tasks into smaller steps and, and help with sequencing issues. Um, so one of the things that we're really working with is that we work very heavily with a particular clinician at the VA in Palo Alto dealing with cognitive impairment of all sorts. And um, she's basically identified that almost everyone with a cognitive impairment runs into an issue where they have uh, they become cognitively overloaded, the, the information is coming at them too quickly, they may have trouble realizing that. Um, so we're looking at a solution where we can have this heart rate monitor wristwatch, which is very hard to actually find in real world, uh, <laughs> and uh, feed the sensor data in, and then if the heart rate is above some level, the thing will pop up, and again, with the clinician's picture, whoever, whatever makes sense, um, asking if they're overwhelmed, if they say yes, it'll walk them through the coping strategies that they already have practiced. Um, and this can also be called up on demand. You see a row of icons on the bottom here. These are kind of specialized plugins for the intervention, so you could actually hit the timeout button here, it would do the same thing. We have another intervention here, we, it's a catcherscape, but it's really it's this thing called an episodic catch, cache, and uh, the idea is that, and folks with multitasking um, issues and executive functions, they get these great ideas, but if they go and write them down, they're totally off track and have difficulty getting back on track. So we've developed this catcher's mitt. You click this, it's gonna come up and say, great, give me a voice recording. And it files it away, and then at some point later in the day, it'll say, let's go through your episodic catch, and, uh, and what do you want to do with it? Do you want to make a task for it? Do you want to link it to a person, put it on a, on a to-do list, or things like that? So we have other, that's kind of where we're going with this plug-in intervention thing, is to take elements of particular clinicians' interventions, let them essentially wrap it up, put a picture on it, and you get a button right on the screen, and you don't have to do any coding for this. This is all done at the, at the user level. Um, well, here, here you see the, the best. Um, that was the heart rate monitor watch. Now, this is the watch, here's a quarter. Um, but we really wanted to carry this around in the real world. Um, and to do that, we'd actually have to carry this battery pack and this wireless gateway in a fanny pack. And it's very cumbersome and relatively expensive. So it's got some problems. We're trying to kind of get rid of all that and replace it with a little Arduino uh, chip and some Zigbee protocol, which would then go right to our phone and, and skip all the mess. Um, but this is really this is really a unicorn. Finding a heart rate monitoring wristwatch that does real time streaming that we can get into our Android app. So uh, we we may, may, may be on to a, a solution, but it's uh, it's been challenging. This is actually old. This just shows the, the RFID tags that we had started with and how they were strapped to different things. Um, so this is that example that I was leading to earlier. Um, here we have a morning routine, making scheduled to make tea at eight and then make cereal and then get the mail. Um, but what's going to happen is we notice through our shake sensor, <coughs> hey, that cereal box just moved, um, but it's only 707 instead of 8, and so our system will automatically make this adjustment. It realized that actually you did the second step first and you did the whole thing an hour earlier. So um, Pete certainly won't prompt you to make cereal at 8 o'clock like it was originally <coughs> going to do because that would be wrong, um, but it's also freed up some time and it can juggle your schedule around. Um, this is that example of what happens when you try to step out without your cane. There's a pressure mat sensor that we were detecting. There's the shake sensor on the cane. Here's the sensor data coming in. And there's the message, I'm not sure if you can read it, but it basically says, you know, please ensure that your cane moved. And this is a little more like, a little too engineering oriented, you know, but uh, well, we're working. That's one of the things we're very interested in is how to have more of a human conversation with people when their schedule issues come up and everything. Um, 
So we have, uh, we've actually worked, uh, our reading clinician does work a lot with folks with MCI, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia. Uh, we actually wrote a big proposal uh, that was a kind of a combined VA and Alzheimer's Association proposal. Um, and some of the things that we came up with is, uh, you know, if you're having free time with someone, maybe it's your daughter, you can have some reminders, um, things you might want to ask her about, maybe some voice recording that you made last time or something you want to tell her about. So the idea is that you can, you can link information to a person's contact and when you're doing an activity with that person, you can, um, you know, help, help you prompt you through some of that stuff. And then uh, you can also do a daily log. That's another one thing that we do is we uh, make it very easy to take pictures and voice recordings, and of course, Pete can prompt you to do that, and uh, and then you get it on your daily log, and it can help uh, jog people's memory uh, and uh, and help help uh, help them remember what happened, perhaps. Uh, it's a little out of order, but uh, jumping into some of the state estimation stuff, uh, I know there's some interest here. This is the work we did with uh, Dr. Kautz, and this is actually showing some work we were doing with the Connect system, uh, just trying to recognize. Uh, when people are doing this activity recognition, are they boiling water? Um, and it's, it's really been quite a challenge, and I've talked to some of you about this before, and probably due to time constraints, I might not get too much into it, but of course, if anyone really wants to get into more detail, you can contact me. Um, a lot of this stuff is really on Henry Kautz's website at the University of Rochester, because um, they really did that state estimation uh, component for us, although I think, uh, quite frankly, I think you guys are way ahead here, and uh, you know, we're really interested in, in trying to develop some of that, um, see if we can plug some of that stuff in here. Um, again, some of the predicates that they're working on. Um, don't, so a little more of that. Uh, this was augmentative communication uh, that we did for the autism folks. So again, a lot of folks with uh, autism have problems with vocabulary, so you pre typically present these augmentative communication pages, you click on these things, and they, they speak for you. So these are different film denominations, different locations, grooming uh, activities. And then these cards are designed to then pop up you know, context-aware vocabulary, so when the student begins the grooming activity, suddenly this set of vocabulary pops up. Um, when they're perhaps engaged in um, a math activity or a money, ma money learning activity, money skill activity, this is the vocabulary that's gonna pop up. So it makes it very easy to pop up the right vocabulary at the right time. Um, the theory is um, seriously decreasing the frustration of the, page, of the, of the student and, and increasing their participation and engagement with the rest of the class. Um, <laughs> So these are um, other additions that were, again, developed for part of the autism project, but totally applicable um, you know, in other cases, is this idea that you can set up uh, reminders that maybe combine pictures and words. Uh, you could set it up to ha pop up on some time schedule every minute, every 10 minutes, or it can happen whenever tasks transition, at the beginning or the end of any task, um, or at the location transitions, or, or any sensor condition, really, any, anything you could say. If the door opens, say this. Um, and this is really helpful just in all kinds of ways. And, uh, and then um, we took that and extended it just a little bit further in this idea that we call pop-up uh, surveys and decision trees. And this gets into kind of experience sampling and momentarily, momentary sampling. And here you can say we wanted to have a student that every 20 minutes, every 20 minutes between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m., this survey is going to pop up. And it's called How Do I Feel? And they can say anxious. And if they say anxious, it has a series of follow-up steps. What do you want to do? And then it'll say, did you do it? And as you go through this, every one of these clicks is going to get logged and sent up to our website where clinicians and therapists and family members, the teachers can all, can all look at it. Um, now we take the same, um, same concept of these pop-up surveys. This is something that the student's going to fill out. Um, but basically it's the same mechanism. We have this for behavior logging. So a, uh, a caregiver or an instructional aide um, can click on this log button, and it'll say, oh, you want to log a student's behavior, which student? Let's log student one's behavior. Oh, here's the behaviors we are tracking for student one. Are they jumping, are they pinching? Those are you know, le less desirable, but we also can have um, positive behaviors that we're tracking. Oh, look, they responded to their cue without being prompted. Um, another thing we care about is, did they use the camera? Because we're really trying to get them to use the camera to, again, be more engaged. Um, so those are some developments we, we, uh, we developed. I think I already talked to you about this timeout break button. Um, here's the PEEP partner. This was another big development we put together is that um, we can have a patient or the teacher, you know, basically the whole team around the patient um, can all have PEEPs and they can all be talking to each other. 
So, um, and then this is the way that they can basically share data. You can send schedule data and other data back and forth. Um, and we call this P partner. And then it all, it all goes up to our website, again, time stamped and graphed. Um, so you can look at the different behaviors um, and things like that. I was got a couple slides, I guess, on, on location or where queuing. Um, so it, within P, you can store a whole bunch of different locations, uh, kind of like context, and it can even be context. Um, but the idea is that you might say that um, your, your, the bank test I showed you earlier had as a precondition that your location is actually at the B of A. And if you start that bank activity and you're not there, it can provide a queue. Say, hey, you better get to the bank. Um, and that was a kind of a premature. And, um, <laughs> let me see, I think you have a... Okay, so here's actually jumps right into some more uh, location aware. Yeah, I wasn't sure exactly how much time I have. How much time do I have, by the way? <laughs> 18 minutes. 18 minutes, okay. We'll spend another five minutes or so and maybe I can open up for discussion or something. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Um, but this is a this is an older version. It's a little black and white, but it's a little bit more on the location monitoring. The idea is you can basically pick these locations and you grab the you grab the, uh, the location. Um, yeah, here's where it says, okay, our bank activity has as a precondition is that we're at the Bank of America. And as I guess the same example we just saw. Um, but what's interesting is that you can also use GPS to know Gee, I'm supposed to be at the bank at 12:30, but you know you're, you're more than a half hour away or something, and so we, we would adjust this gets to the question of when would you do the prompting? Is well, we, if, if we know, well, if we know you're at the bank at the you know at the right time, we won't have to prompt you. If we know that you're you know you know uh, an hour away um, and it's only going to take you a half hour, we don't have to prompt you until until the very last minute. So anyway, we can consider the location, the distance of travel to help us decide when to, to provide that that cue. Um, and then that example I gave you earlier about, well, we're stuck at the bank, we need an extra 15 minutes. Um, we can use GPS to help us with that. Um, we can detect when you walked out of the bank. So we don't have to ask you, are you done at the bank? And if you're, you know, if you're still at the bank and you're really ready, you need to get on to the next task, we can actually consider priorities to help us decide what to do. So if we really are going to be late, but the next task and the next task is higher, Priority, then we'll, we'll probably generate the stop here and say, okay, you know, really should think about getting out of the bank, getting on to the next task. You know, but if the next task is a lower priority, maybe it doesn't care. They'll just let you let you stay at the bank as long as you want, um, and then and then uh, it'll know when you get in the car and drive away from the bank, you're you're no longer there, and you'll be able to get on to your next task. Um, so this talks a little bit about the speech interface. Um, basically, putting a little microphone on the top, commit voice command, you click on it, it'll say speak now. And this is an actual conversation, but basically it says, you know, what do you want to do? You can add a task, you can add a contact, you can look up information, and it'll just kind of walk you through it. So this is this is kind of really experimental for us. We're, we're still developing this, but it's really where we want to go. We want to have the voice uh, recognition and the conversational uh, side of things going. Um, this is a little bit more on the state estimation stuff, a little more detail, but you can see some of the predicates um, that they were working on. Um, Detecting through, uh, I think this was probably through the Connect spec. Um, so the environmental predicates, the relationships, uh, are things above each other? Are they on the same plane? Is there a movement in one direction or another? And uh, these are some of the uh, activity recognition models that have been attempted. Um, the hierarchical HMMs. Um, I recalled since I talked to you earlier, <laughs> that is that one of the reasons they did the H hierarchical HMMs is they're really working on this idea of interleaved actions. And so what happens if you start the morning, get halfway through your morning routine, and then you, you stop and you go do something else? And this whole idea was they developed these hierarchical HMMs so that you could kind of park one activity model. It's like, okay, that, one's, that one's on hold. They're now doing this other one, and then be able to recognize Oh, okay, now they're back to the first one. Let's get back to that first one. So that, I believe, was the main motivation for these hierarchical HMMs. Um, and then we've also tried these dy dynamic Bayesian networks and uh, Markov logic networks. Um, again, I probably would have to refer you a little more to Henry's website for that. Um, Setting state of the art, we went through all this. I think the one, oh, here we go, okay. So here's some um, applications to dementia. Um, so it's already being used today with dementia and MCI patients. Um, of course, 
We started with TBI, and TBI predisposes people to dementia. Um, and what's nice is if they start using PEEP with their TBI, then when the dementia kicks in maybe 10, 20 years later, hopefully with Oculus, I have a system in place um, that can help them with it. Um, <coughs> You know, daily activity systems, we talked about that, but some of the life logging we talked about with the pictures, um, and uh, you know, a lot of the same type of stuff that we're uh, doing with everyone else. Checklists, personal data review, um, that meeting prep was the thing that I was hoping you're gonna meet with your daughter, here's some things you might wanna remember about her. Um, we can assist with medical appointments, um, so that you can, you can make a lot of voice recordings, store them on an appointment, and then when you go see the doctor, you'll have that information available to you. Um, checklists are always helpful. Again, preparing for visits, we've talked about some of that stuff, and life logging. So these are some of the things that we, we feel that could be very helpful. Um, another area that um, our clinician uh, has been very focused on is helping the caregivers, particularly uh, not just with brain injury, but also with uh, mild cognitive impairment. And so the idea is that the, the, patient, the, the patient and the caregiver both have a, a version of PEEP. They're both providing coping strategies, but the caregiver's coping strategies, of course, are a little different than the patient's coping strategies. Um, but anyway, those are all some of the areas that we feel it can be very helpful. Um, we talked about it as, as being a tool for researchers, and that's probably a good place to pick up some of the discussion. Um, but we will have to come back to that. Um, we're doing some work with this actigraph, so we have some sleep study stuff going on. I think I'm at this point just giving you some teasers for additional discussion, but I did want to make sure I covered this Prado therapy just a bit. So this is the, uh, the intervention that our, our clinician at the, uh, at the <coughs> Palo Alto Neuropsychological Assessment Intervention Clinic has developed called Crater. Um, and this is, you know, she's been doing this for 30 years and has found that this is just something she does with everyone with every cognitive impairment, and it just, just seems to be very, very helpful. And so the main four points for creative therapy is, and, and the reason I'm showing you this is that we're basically integrating Pete very, very tightly in with this, and essentially putting buttons on the screen that, that help with this. So the main steps are regularizing sleep and wake cycles, uh, these biological rhythms, and then anchoring these cognitive strategies to those biological rhythms. So first you get the sleep, you use Pete to help regularize the sleep through prompting, regularize our sleep and meal cycles. Once that's set, then we uh, apply cognitive strategies such as look at your calendar after every meal, just to orient yourself in time and space. Um, but besides regularizing, then there's identification of what is this particular uh, patient's catastrophic reaction. When they become overloaded, what do they do? Everyone does something a little different. Some people shut down, some people cry, some people laugh, some people make funny noises, um, but everyone has something different. And so that's the way she does it. First, regularize it, figure out what's their catastrophic response, then she wants to train them to recognize that response in order to then invoke the intervention. And that's where Pete comes in, is if we can use sensors somehow to recognize that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we can get voice recognition working well, we can tell when they're saying the, the trigger phrase or something like that. So, but that's the idea, is figure out when, they, when is this thing being triggered and then prompt them with the appropriate uh, strategy. Um, another part of it is this idea of forming an alliance between the participant, the therapist, and the significant other, and essentially taking the, the, the patient, you know, it's largely with brain injury, but you know, also with MCI, you know, the person's feeling you know, they're not quite the person they used to be, they may be losing a little self-esteem, and the idea here is like everyone team up and say, it's not you, it's this disease that's done something to your brain, and to just try to help them um, deal with that. And then this uh, leads to this cognitive restructuring, uh, which is to change the source of that person's self-esteem. They may have thought they were the fastest and the best, um, but now they're the most resilient. Now they're the ones that can take advantage of the tools around them to, to do what they need to do. And so those are the four pieces of a creative therapy, and it is an acronym. Um, catastrophic reaction, dealing with that, the regularization, the alliance of everyone, and triangulating against this uh, external demon, um, and then applying the, the coping strategy. So that's basically her craniotherapy. Um, it's just one of many, many. I'm sure there are people in here, in this room, who have their own approaches, but um, this is one we've been using um, pretty successfully at the VA in Palo Alto. And I think that actually does bring us to the end. So uh, I've been happy to take any questions. <laughs> if I have any more time. <laughs> 10 minutes. Cool, yeah. I'll, um, have you found it very difficult uh, managing uh, health data? Dealing with 
the privacy, privacy issue. issue. Stuff, yeah. um, well, certainly in the VA, they're very concerned about it. So there, everything's um, kind of in lockdown. Um, but we, we, uh, you know, certainly in IRB approved case studies, we, we take great care of it. But we don't have any any magic bullet. What we do is so our data is all encrypted. Um, you can have passwords on the device. Um, if you don't, if you don't use those options that send it up to the web, it stays on the phone, and so that that helps a lot for that area. Rich, it seemed like um, for a lot, there's a lot of rules and decisions, and so how does all that get programmed into Peach? So, which rules particularly? Are you um, uh, just. You know, if if the person doesn't step here, and oh. you know this pressure, or um, like if the person's at the bank, does it does it automatically know that, or do you have to program it ahead of time to know that this is the lo location for the bank? I guess I'm wondering how how much how much rule programming mm -hmm. there is, and how much it, it just automatically is able to do with algorithms. Or um, so now I'm stretching into computer science that I, I don't exactly no. know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the answer is. Um, there's not a lot that is, basically you do have to enter it in yourself, but you can do as much as you want. So the issues about, okay, you know, if you don't step here, then this is gonna happen. You know, those are sensor monitor conditions that you would put in there. So we don't automatically, uh, uh, we don't have any, we are not doing any machine learning. Um, so we don't have any way to actually learn, um, this is what it looks like to step outside. So we do, we do put that in. We try to make it very easy um, by using a, you know just an Android interface and drop down menus and picking things up and um, through the use of these templates where you can have these these pre-programmed lists um, would make it easier for you know the user or someone to be able to enter this stuff in now in the context of a, a like, let's say a school or a hospital setting or assisted living facility there may be a lot of shared information you know like Having dinner may be very similar for a lot of people, or certainly in the VA, you see a lot of the same clinicians, you have a lot of the same types of appointments. Those can all be loaded in libraries and put in these template lists. So um, in those types of cases, you can get a lot of reuse, and you don't have to rebuild everything from scratch, but that's certainly an area that we take very seriously. It's one of the first questions we always get, is who programs this thing? And so, um, so we've been doing this for a long time, and in this new version that's really only been out, almost out like a year, let's say, this Android, application um, we've really put a lot of effort into this wizard thing that I was showing you so that you know you, we used to just drop people into this big form and you had to fill out all the pieces and now we really are really working hard on this wizard thing and we really want to get to this conversational thing where you just talk through it um, oh, I want to do this okay let's walk you through the questions and, and things like that but um, yeah the quick answer is we don't do any any machine learning we're very interested in it actually and there's a lot of opportunity for it we're, we're collecting a lot of data here we know everything they press we know what they're doing um, and so that, that's certainly an area for, for future research. And I had another. Go, no. no, no. Oh, oh. Okay. I had another question about training and your experience in training people how to use P, um, uh, people at different cognitive levels, or you know what sort of um, training mechanisms are you using that seem to be more helpful than others? So you know there there there's. A lot of technology out there, but I haven't seen a lot about the best ways to actually train people how how to use these technologies. Another, so, have you been doing some of that, and, yeah. and what have you found helpful? So that's another good question, and uh, again, it has to do with all, like, a wide range of our users. Now, in the clinical setting, they have a clinician that basically they work with, and we also have a staff member um, on site at the VA often. And uh, you know, basically, um, that, that's actually something I think I'm going to mention that we're going to try to do a real experiment on. Is is we want to measure. Um, if we introduce to the person, oh, press this button after every meal. I, I didn't get to show you. We have a picture of a, of a cupcake, uh, which represents this idea that after every meal, check your calendar. So it's called beat dessert, and you click the cupcake, and it check it. So we're going to do an experiment, which is um, how many times did the clinician have to tell you to click that cupcake before you start clicking it yourself? So we don't have any data on that yet, but it's The conference is about to end. Um, <laughs> that's a good prompt. <laughs> But, um, but basically, we do we do a kind of a one on one, and you know it depends. You could have some people that only have three or four tasks in there, and it's not going to take them that much. And if you lock someone into the cue card, they only have to know how to respond to the cue card, and so it, it's very variable. And um, again, we don't have any great solution. We want to have a lot more online help, so extending that concept of the wizard 
um, basically I want to turn that into a training wizard. So it's not just I want to add a task, it's like, you know, well, I want to do this more complicated thing. And so it'll walk you through those things. So it's another area for, for future work. Okay, we got a lot of questions. You were actually were up before uh, I went back to, okay. Um, how would you measure performance on the task completion part of it? Um, so is it time, and then how fast it took you to complete it some task, or the number of tasks completed overall in a day? So, so um, different people value uh, things differently, so for older folks, time may not be um, yeah, so this kind of also kind of gets into the issue of you know verifying that they actually did. So I mean, one thing is we can of course, if they're responding and they're confirming all the tasks, we can kind of count the check boxes, how many things we checked off. But they may or may not have really done it. Um, so, so you mentioned something about uh, the supporting memory and that being a, a big part of uh, research initiatives. So I'm wondering if that could somehow be tied in into like the task performance stuff. And How do you see the working memory? Is it like you quiz them and see if they remember doing it, or? Well, I don't know. Well, it, it's um, it, it, the area of test performance is very uh, important. In the case of our autism studies that we hope to get funded for, we're actually going to have observers in the room. But basically, we we have we can track. Um, we have access to whatever sensors we have. We could, we, could, we could use that to validate it. We have access to what buttons they press. But yeah, there's always the question of how do we really know what they said they did. So uh, I'm not sure I have any, any, any great answer on that one. But uh, the idea of using working memory is, you know, I'm very interested in actually kind of quizzing them on what they did, <laughs> you know, using the log and, and seeing if they remember it. Uh, we'll just kind of go around the order. I know you were up to that still. Thanks. Uh, you briefly spoke about encryption in your initial answer to the initial question. Uh, but in my understanding that the encryption is not security, um, how secure is PIT? That is my question. And how does a PIT guarantee uh, user data confidentiality? Uh, um, what about the notion of privacy, for example? Um, well, I would, I would say that um, we don't have anything, we have, you know, you can have password protection, so no one can get into the device unless you do your password. Um, and, and, yeah, we encrypt our data. I don't think we have anything too much more specialized than that. Um, the stuff that does go up to the web certainly goes through, you know, in, encrypted, um, you know, secure SSH, and then, um, you know, it's up there. But I don't, I don't know if there's, a, if there's a particular encryption method that you're um, kind of thinking about. I, I, I'm not sure what it is, but we don't. We don't, I, that's basically what we do. Is you can have password protection, and the data is encrypted, and if you don't lose your device and you don't send it up to the web, it's 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 on that. That's that's its location. And you you know you can also get these apps that if you lose your device, you can press a button and it'll wipe the device out. So you know um, those are some of the solutions. I don't know. Is there something um, you're particularly hoping to see that we had or? Well, yes. Uh, uh, Encrypting data, right? Uh, who should have access to encrypted data? The users. What if the user, the users are ignorant? Yes. Who should have access to user data? Are you programmers? <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Mike. I'm getting prompted. Um, so you're saying that um, <laughs> what happens if the person doesn't have isn't around the device and someone else gets the device, or if the person is ill? Is ill. Just put it there. Oh well, I mean. Is, is, if it's password protected and they didn't have the password, yeah, they wouldn't really be able to get in there. But if the person's ill and gave the password to someone else, then that other.